Brilliant. Okay, what we'll do now is I'll do the last part of the presentation, then there'll be more time for, for questions. So Olaf suggested I did a little bit of a quick talk through language and terminology. I'm not actually going to talk about what to say, just why language matters and different sort of perspectives on it. So, so why does language matter? And do we have the right to tell people what they should or shouldn't say? Does it matter if people get offended? Is this all about political correctness? Obviously, there's a, this whole constant narrative that there's this so-called culture war, which is propagated by people who get a lot of money out of saying there's some kind of culture war going on. But really, essentially, what it comes down to is when you're working somewhere, you're representing an organisation. Um, in your personal life, you know, you use whatever language you like and that's your business. Obviously, there might be consequences. You know, people might react to certain things you say or don't say, but in your personal life, that's kind of up to you. But if you work for an organisation and representing that organisation, what you say and what's on your website, it's going to affect how you're perceived. And if you're using outdated or inappropriate language, then people might think the business is unsympathetic or out of touch and it sort of has a great impression. And it might mean people don't feel included or don't feel welcome. Um, and it's not about political correctness, but really this is a customer service thing about sort of, for example, I used to work prior to my job getting more people working in the music industry. My job for actually was having to work with festivals. Every festival I'd go to, um, there'd be an incident where a steward at some point said to someone, you don't, you don't look disabled. And that would always... You know, that was pretty much the guaranteed way to get a complaint is to say to a customer who is disabled, you don't look disabled. There's no, there's no, nothing that I would say is more of a red rag than that, that I've come across in sort of seven years in the charity. So it's sort of about customer service and not, not affecting, impacting someone's experience. So when we talk about inappropriate language, it might be outdated language that was acceptable at one point, but now got negative connotations. A lot of the language you use, um, even a word such as spastic, for example, um, scope, the cerebral palsy charity were called the spastic society until the 1980s. And then that word acquired negative connotations through, through the playground, essentially. Um, you get some things which are fine in a specific uh, use, but then use, are used generally. So the term dwarfism, it's a specific medical condition, um, but 300 conditions could cause some to short on a statue, and so to cause it, calling someone a dwarf without knowing what their diagnosis is or how they perceive themselves, again, just is sort of using a very specific term in the wrong context. Also making assumptions about how people feel, a term such as wheelchair bound, suggests that someone who's in a wheelchair is imprisoned in it, and really, if you're a wheelchair user, then actually that's a really useful tool from getting you from A to B, which you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Wheelchairs are quite helpful things and no one's actually sort of bound in them. And sort of, and similarly when people talk about someone suffering from a condition, ultimately you're making an assumption that someone's not happy, which may not be, may not be the case. Also inaccurate lang or misleading language. So if you talked about a blind dog or a disabled toilet, obviously a blind dog, a dog which assists blind people is not a blind dog. That's a dog that can't see. If you've got someone really pedantic, and I work with someone really pedantic, they point out that a disabled toilet is a toilet which is currently not working, rather than an accessible toilet, which is a toilet which is accessible for people. Um, and irrelevant information. So when you start putting your personal opinion on things and saying, ah, you must feel this or this must, you know, essentially, you know, it's about, you know, it's about not assuming, essentially. This is what this all comes down to. Um, and inappropriate language can imply negative attitudes. If you're using... Well, often what happens is words for disability become insults in school playgrounds. And that sort of means that you're putting people you perceive as kind of foolish, as you're associating, associating disability with weakness and stupidity by using those terms. And ultimately... You know, when people use term, you know, when kids use terms for disability in school playgrounds, they're reflecting a social attitude they picked up somewhere, and they're picking. It, it, it's a, you know, you can easily say it's kids being kids, and it kind of is. But it's also kids reflecting an attitude they picked up somewhere in society that being disabled is is worse than not being disabled, and the people who are disabled are of a lower status than people who who aren't, and often they're getting that attitude from from somewhere. Um, words themselves don't really mean anything. I mean, words are collections of sounds. Essentially, we, we give a meaning to words, and it's the meanings we give that have the impact. Um, 
that's where that next stage slide went. It's not really that helpful there, but there we go. I told you there was one. Uh, can language be reclaimed? So I was trying to do the power, I was trying to finalise a PowerPoint yesterday on a on a train with an iPhone. I don't know if you've ever tried using PowerPoint on an iPhone, but in one word, don't. Um, so can language be reclaimed? So sometimes people say they're reclaiming language. You can only kind of do that if you if you're affected by that language. So a word such as moron or idiot is actually, historically, the terms moron or idiot were named medical terms for people with low IQs. Anyone with an IQ of 50 to 75, I think, was, uh, was an idiot. And anyone with an IQ of 25 to 50 was a, was a moron. And, um, and essentially, that's kind of been forgotten now. So if you use those terms, no one's going to think that's words related to disability, if you use a term such as spastic or other more recent terms, then obviously that still has an impact. And this is something where this isn't just about disability, obviously within, um, within the black community, within the LGBT community, certain words have been reclaimed. But that doesn't change the fact that some people in those communities, those are the terms they were insulted with at school. And just because some people use them doesn't mean everyone's going to be going to be comfortable. Uh, and, you know, reclaiming a word's lessons of power can only be done by someone who's who's affected by that. So if you do upset or offend someone, um, apologise, first of all. I mean, first thing is just sort of say sorry. Generally speaking, the problem isn't when people say something, it's when people dig in afterwards. If you look at Twitter and you sort of see, see what I mean. But, you know, listen and try and learn. Try to learn what it is you said and why it mattered. Um, try not to defend or justify yourself and don't say that the person shouldn't have been offended. That's honestly not going to help. Honestly, if someone's upset, say, well, you shouldn't be upset by that, is never, ever going to calm anyone down. Um, if you're in a work in somewhere and you think there's a complaint, chance of a complaint would arise, just sort of be open about it and say, this has happened. And, but also don't beat yourself up. With language, with terminology, everyone sometimes says not quite the right thing, something they don't mean whatever else. And it's not, it's not the end of the world. It's obviously not nice to feel you've upset someone. But what can happen, the, the parallel to this, which I think is why I'll have suggested that I talked about it, is because often people are scared of saying the wrong thing. So maybe don't talk to disabled people at all. And disabled people experience higher um, amounts of isolation than the rest of the community. Um, in, in statistical research it shows and research has shown that people sometimes avoid talking to say what people are not sure what to say and essentially don't panic you know you might say you might say something that's not quite right but generally people are just kind of laugh it off or correct you have heard something before it's not often you're really going to cause devastating offence when you don't when you don't intend to do so and I want to talk about some cultural differences and to give an example so four different phrases here people with disabilities disabled people the disabled and handicapped now handicapped is outdated language it's not massively used now but is used in America and is used in Europe. So you may sometimes he come across that term. I wouldn't advise ever using it to a customer, uh, but if someone says it's you and they're European or American, then that, that, that sometimes happens, those terms are used there. The disabled, again, I, I mean, the disabled is a term I would, I would generally use. Um, whenever anyone, my general rule in life, if someone uses the word the, followed by a kind of wide general term for a group of people, they're rarely being complimentary. And I think when you say the disabled, it sounds a bit sort of dismissive and you're not really, you're talking about people as a kind of homogenous group, they probably aren't. But disabled people and people with disabilities are worth talking about. Now, attitude is everything where I work. Work on what's called the social model of disability. And the whole idea of the social model of disability is that people don't have disabilities. That what disables people is society. That you need to remove the barriers from society. So, therefore, people are... People don't have disabilities, people have impairments, people are disabled by society. And so I would say I was a disabled person. However, there's also a lot of people who say, actually, my disability doesn't define me. I'm a person who has a disability because... Actually, yes, I'm a person first, and my disability is something I have, but it's not, it's not me. And, I, what I, and I, I'm not making life easier by saying some people use one and some people use the other. But I think it's really important I am honest. There's not sort of right or wrong answers. Generally speaking, disabled activists are more likely to use disabled people. Most disabled people are not disability activists, and it's really important to remember that. So what can be very often helpful is to mirror the language someone uses. So if someone uses a term 
them to describe themselves, then use use that term. As long as that term isn't sort of massively sort of shocking or offensive, or you're not comfortable saying it, then use the, you know use the way people describe themselves, let them guide you, and that's generally the best way to go. Um, so. Before I go on to questions, I want to just quickly talk about some resources we've got, our Accessible Employment Guide, our Just Ask campaign, Live Events Access Charter, and my email address. So please do get in touch with me about any of this, any of this. And um, yeah, all of these resources are available on our website, which is atchoosefting.org.uk. Um, I'm pretty certain my details are on the White Days website, uh, but please do, yeah, please do get in touch with me with any questions. I'm really happy to help or kind of try and corner me later. That's also fine. Um, so that's ways we can help you. And I want to talk about some other resources before I come to questions. So we've got Inclusion Scotland, who are the disability-led pan-disability pan organisation in Scotland. Uh, we've got Drake Music Scotland, who do a lot of great work around artists. Uh, Ewan's Guide, who were mentioned earlier, Earlier, a great resource for accessibility of venues uh, and the gig buddies scheme also was mentioned earlier so gig buddies essentially very often when people have um, paid personal assistance particularly people with learning disabilities what can happen is that those those paid assistants are paid until nine in the evening so then people lose their paid assistance at nine in the evening so a few years ago i played a uh, a gig at a learning disability night and it was amazing it's sort of nine o'clock the room 8 30 in fact the room sort of emptied out because because everyone sort of had to go home because they're um the per, you know the personal assistance shifts were ending so what gig buddies do is a buddying scheme basically and anyone can volunteer for them and they obviously do i say anyone they will obviously do checks if you try to volunteer with them anyone can apply to volunteer with them but essentially what you can do with gig buddies is go you know act as a as a buddy to go to a gig with someone who uh, um who has a learning disability and act as a personal assistant and accompany them people are paired based on music taste people make friendships out of it it's a really nice thing it started in brighton but now is um in various different places around the around the uk and it's essentially is a way of making tackling the isolation which people with learning disabilities in, in particular often experience because um well because a people aren't sure about how to approach disabled people b because people lose their personal assistance early so then don't have a social life and then see because very often in particular people in kind of residential accommodation essentially they will be risk assessed for absolutely everything against loneliness except loneliness so essentially you know there'll be a whole thing about you know what well, should we should we should we let, let, you know kind of allow people to go out and genuinely a friend of mine worked in a a home in, run by one of the big national disability charities where it was sort of the idea that people might go to the pub and drink some alcohol was sort of carefully risk assessed and then discouraged and obviously that then affects people's social interaction so these are some great resources worth knowing about um, that's basically um, the end of the presentation but we've got a couple of minutes for questions if anyone's got any if we've not if anyone's not that's absolutely fine as well okay cheers Brew. Well, thanks very much, everyone. We've obviously got a uh, full programme. <laughs> So there's some great stuff to stick around for this afternoon, um, and then this evening, obviously more gigs. I don't know why I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm, why I've decided that I'm, I'm emceeing the whole thing, but there we go. This appears to be a mode I've moved into. But um, thank you all. Thank you very much.